Hey, everybody, it's Mark Patterson. I'm back. It is July 2nd when I'm making this recording. And before I get into today's episode, I always want to remind people to go to my website, www.markpattersonnfl.com. Uh, we continue to post various press releases that are going on. We've also got a big movie premiere with the NFL that documented my entire journey uh, pre-Everest and then, of course, on Everest and then post-Everest. And that's coming out in early September. We're having a big premiere event here in Sun Valley, Idaho on September 23rd. If you're interested in that, more info to follow as we get further into July. And then, as always, we continue to raise money for Amelia's Everest and and that vehicle goes through higher ground. So not a penny goes to me or Amelia. It all goes to that wonderful organization just really out there helping um, a whole lot of folks with uh, adaptive issues and just mental, uh, bringing them here to Sun Valley, Idaho and getting them out on the river, fly fishing, mountain biking, river rafting during the winter, certainly with skiing and outdoor activities like that. So just a great, great, great organization. So uh, if it makes sense to you, then please uh, go onto my website, www.barkpattisonnfl.com. You can hit the philanthropy tab and that can lead you right to the higher ground. And finally, I am now launching, this will be episode 2000 or two, uh, 201 episodes. There we go. I had to spit that out. I have not done one in quite some time. And now we're going to start ramping back up with the pods, hit kind of a milestone before I went over to Mount Everest, hit 200 uh, episodes, and then was not able to upload uh, more pods uh, from base camp. There wasn't enough bandwidth to do that. So I just decided to take a break and now I'm back. And so I'm going to jump into that. And typically I, I have a guest on and today what I decided to do is do a solo cast. I know there's a lot of you who have, who have asked to get my reflections and thoughts. And I got to tell you, one of the reasons why I didn't jump in right after I got off the mountain is I discovered I had some sort of PTSD. And so what that means is Essentially, the the trauma that I went through on Summit Day, coming down, being snow blind, getting face whipped by these ice particles, running out of oxygen, um, not only coming down the mountain, but also uh, I spent the night with no oxygen. So I was up there from, gosh, 9 o'clock p.m. at night. Uh, this is at 26,500 feet. And I did not start sucking nose again until about 6 o'clock the next morning. Uh, and we'll get into that a little bit later. So it seems like the further I've gotten out, the more a I've appreciated the 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 adventure, the expedition, and the accomplishment. And then b, uh, just there's been a lot of things that I hadn't recalled when I came off the mountain. That um, upon further review and thought about all these different nuances that were going on minute by minute, uh, these stories, which were real, have all come to me uh, very vividly. So it's interesting the way that the body heals and the body protects and then things that come back to you. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to start off uh, just really relaying my appreciation to everybody uh, for all the support. It's it's just really, it, it, it was humbling. It blew me away, the amount of people on Instagram in particular were coming on by the hundreds every single day and rooting me on. It felt like a rocky story. And I, I got to tell you at the very end, and we'll get into that, into this in a bit, um, on summer day, I needed all those people. I needed all you people that were out there rooting me on and, 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 and following the journey. And, and I don't know, it was what I said or how I said it that was different from other people that certainly have gone before me, but it seemed to really resonate with, a lot of you guys out there. And, and for that, I'm very, very, very appreciative. So let's start off with uh, Mount Everest. So I took off around March 30th and landed in Kathmandu. And we we uh, were staying at the Yak and Yeti Hotel. And by, I don't know, maybe April 2nd, all of our expedition members had actually flown in and had met us there. And within a day or two of that, we ended up Going outside by the pool, there's a big, there was 21 of us all together. And the whole idea was to take a COVID test before we actually took off and started heading towards the mountain. And so we did that. And, and of the 21, there were two people that came down with COVID. Apparently they were not vaccinated when they came over to Nepal, number one. And number two is that when they, when they took the COVID test, they must've gotten the COVID bug. 
on their plane. And so it was such a bummer for them because they were knocked off our, our expedition. And uh, not only did they have to go and move out of the hotel, but move into an apartment. But after they got better 15 days later, the government prevented them from flying out of the country because they wanted them to quarantine for another 15. So if you can imagine being a month in an apartment and uh, pretty miserable and spend all that money and that time training and everything else, and you can't go. So unfortunate for them, but off we went and off we went meant that we went and, and uh, got into these small planes and we flew into what is described as the most dangerous airport in the world called Lukla. And Lukla is a high mountainous village with a short airstrip of about 300 yards. And it actually sits on a cliff and it goes uphill. And so if you can imagine landing and going uphill and slamming on the brakes all at one time, it's pretty terrifying. And then of course, going back out, you have to fly off the cliff, which you drop off. And then you have to bank hard left because there's a mountain on the other side that if, you know, certainly if you went forward, you'd crash into, and that's not the goal. So off we went. And I think the the biggest question that everybody is, has been, uh, asking me and the most surprised is the length of time you actually spend on Mount Everest. And so I was up there over 60 days. It's crazy to think about that, but um, it's a long time. And if nothing else, it's kind of an endurance game of how long can you be on that mountain and go through all the different things with bad food and, you know, being cold every night and, and not taking showers and all the conveniences that we normally have, but, but that's what it takes. And, and after all said and done, when we started with 21, uh, on summit day, we were down to 11 people and of the 11, only 10 made it. So that's, you know, more than half that didn't make it or went home early and just couldn't handle the, the conditions. Some was just, I want to get back to my family and have good food. And others, there was the, the altitude had a serious impact on, on their lungs and they just couldn't handle it. And, and so they had to go down, which again, was unfortunate, but uh, it is it is 60 days when you're up there and there's a lot of things that go on and, and we'll get into that in just a minute. When you fly into Lukla, Lukla is located at 9,300 feet and kind of the whole goal is to trek to Everest Base Camp, which is at 17,500 feet. And the distance between that is about 40 miles and those 40 miles take about 12 days. And so as you're going through the countryside, uh, there are no roads. Uh, all the transportation of many of the goods and services that they have are done on yak backs or porters that are carrying these enormous loads up the mountain. I have just mad respect for these people who do this. I can't imagine doing that, but it's such a poor country. People are willing to do anything to make a buck, and that certainly is one way that they do that. In this last year, 2020, I was supposed to go to Mount Everest. Of course, things got shut down. The whole world collapsed. and my Everest expedition got pushed out into this year. And even this year, 2021, it was a question mark whether or not we were actually going to go go forward or not. And kind of at the last minute, the government opened up and said that they were going forward, go forward with climbing the mountain and, and allowing people coming to come in. But that still had prevented you know millions of people from doing the annual passage of at least trying to climb from Lukla to Everest Base Camp. It's a very popular trek. And of course, all these villagers with these lodges and the food and everything else, that's what they depend on in terms of, of their living every single year. Uh, as we wound our way up the mountain, you know, it was just a great time to bond with the expedition team. And it's not hardcore. It's just a long stroll. We probably go five miles every day. And of course you continue to climb, climb, climb. And while you're doing this, you're really trying to do two things. One, um, you're trying to build up red blood cells in your body. So you have more oxygen that can, can uh, fuel your system and that you can actually endure and handle the altitude. Once you start getting up much higher, um, it's, it, it has caused a lot of issues for a lot of people in the past anywhere from cerebral edema, which is swelling of the brain to pulmonary edema, which is swelling of the lungs. And if you don't get it right and you're not well conditioned, and if you don't spend enough time there, your body just can't produce enough red blood cells to allow you somewhat safe passage uh, up there. And even if you're up there for two months, doesn't guarantee that you're not going to get those conditions. So that's one of the reasons why we take our time meandering up the mountain. The other, the other part of that too, is that 
year round, there was a jet stream that sits on top of the mountain uh, where we just got off of. And, and so what, what happens is two weeks and it's not exactly to the day, i.e. 14 days or 10 days or nine days. It's whatever the weather's going to be. But generally speaking, there can be anywhere from seven to 14 days where there's safe passage, where the jet stream actually rises above and allows you to go up there. So there's not weather of 200 miles per hour and blowing hardcore snow. And you get into superstorms like you saw in that movie uh, Into Thin Air and what actually happened in real life with the John Krakauer book in 19. Um, 96. So that's the reason why we start in early April and we make our way up and then we wait until, as we did, uh, till late May before we go for the top. Boy, there's a lot of things that went up. The first thing is Everest Base Camp. You know, it's probably as set up and dialed in as you could possibly get. It sits right at the base of the, the Kumba Ice Fall. And the Kumba Ice Fall is essentially a very steep 2,000 foot grade. Uh, that has all these ice blocks and there's no way that you can get around climbing up Mount Everest without actually going through this. I went through it five times and it, it's actually completely terrifying. And it's terrifying because it's a moving glacier. Uh, it moves three feet a day. And um, anytime that we went through it, we'd always go through it at three a or three or four o'clock uh, in the morning when it's dark. And of course it's the coldest point of the day. And essentially there's these gigantic ice blocks, ice boulders, ice columns that are constantly moving and collapsing and falling down. And so obviously it's like roulette every single time that you go through and you are trying not to have one of those fall on your head. I ended up on my own several times, just the way the group would spread out. And there was one point where there was an avalanche that was coming straight down. I thought it was going to knock me out. There's no, nothing I could do about it. And um, kind of at the last minute, it took a sharp right hand turn. And so at the end of the day, I wasn't in danger. But, you know, when you're standing there and this avalanche is coming at you, you're not sure what's going to happen exactly. And so um, off I went up and down and up and down. And so first camp is at Camp uh, Camp One. That's at 19,500. So, again, that 2,000 foot gain, you emerge out of the Kumba Ice Fall and then you're going through these series of crevasses, you're going up, you're going down 60 foot ice walls that if anything that you go up, of course, you have to repel back down when you're coming off the mountain. And then going to camp two is at 21,500 feet. And that's going up the Western Coombe. And the Western Coombe is like a gradual uphill, gigantic snow field. And that thing got smoking hot a couple of times. And it got hot because just the, the sun reflecting off the snow, bouncing back on your face. It just made it such that it was just a long, slow grind going up. And you had to stay in a pretty confined, small path, you know, in the snow going straight up because it was a huge crevasse field on either side. We actually, towards the end uh, in May, we had a Sherpa that was coming up from Camp 1 to Camp 2. And he hadn't clipped in and he fell into a ice wall and down a crevasse head first and got wedged in and never made it out. And he died of exposure. So if you don't watch yourself, man, it can be really, really, really dangerous. So off we went um, back and forth and back and forth. And every time you go up, then you go down and you come back up again a few days later and go a little further and then come back down. Camp three, it's tough. It's tough going, man, because you have to climb the, the low face and, and once you come into camp three, uh, it sits on about a 45 degree slope. And that's where we slept as we got towards the end there when we we're going for the top. And it's pretty terrifying um, just because the way that the, the, the tents are anchored in and the way that we have to navigate that, uh, trying to get in and out of the tent and making sure that you're always clipped in, that you don't fall down the mountain. Speaking of being clipped in, this mountain is quite a bit different because Unlike every other mountain I've been on where you have a rope team and that rope team is tethered between one person to the next. And typically there'd be four people um, on, a, on a rope team. You are tethered to the mountain on Mount Everest. That means that about every hundred yards, there's a rope and it is secured by two ice screws in the ground. And then you have a harness around your waist and there is about a three foot strap connected to your waist with a carabiner on the end. 
And every time you go anywhere on the mountain, you're constantly clipping into this rope so that if you happen to fall, that the rope is going to catch you. And the furthest you can go is just the length of that particular rope line. So that actually happened to me. Uh, I think it was my second rotation. I was coming down and uh, down through the ice fall and I was coming down a ladder and I just wasn't paying attention. I was a little tired and actually ended up falling head first uh, backwards down a 12 foot ladder and, and I got banged up and bruised and everything else. But fortunately I was clipped into the line, the fixed line so that I didn't continue down into a series of crevasses, which could have been fatal and uh, very lucky to get out of that scraped up, but nonetheless, a little smarter and, and making sure that anytime I'd go forward with that, I would certainly be um, more aware and, 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 and with better concentration and focus around going through up and down these different ladders that I had to go through. So you're up and you're down and you're up and you're down and people are dropping out and there's helicopters coming in left and right. And meanwhile, through this whole thing, um, we had this outbreak of COVID and the Nepalese government really tried to keep this under wraps. Um, they didn't want the COVID outbreak to get out because again, they depend so much on their tourism. And so they don't want, they didn't want people to not come to the country and they just certainly didn't want to shut down the mountain. Although they did shut down a mountain down the Valley, a Delacumba Valley. I'm not sure which one, but I'd heard that. And so it was real that this could happen, but nonetheless, there were exp full expedition parties. The further we got into this, that were canceling the entire the entire trip. And it'd be a bummer because somebody could have been vaccinated, but if there's various Sherpas, um, which are the support uh, team and various members of the climate team that are getting COVID, you can't go because you need everybody working together. And so just very unfortunate. And the other thing that we're contending with is that there were two cyclones that hit the country and, and, and certainly down below um, that turns into rain, that moisture and up above it's deep snow. And so when we decided to go for the top, it was really a function of, of not being able to see a weather forecast and then go to the day before, because you have so far to go up the mountain, you have to rest and you go up the mountain, you have to rest. Um, we, we were looking at probably 15, six, or I'm sorry, five or six days before uh, we were going to go up the mountain to, to make that call. So we actually um, looked at the weather map on the 14th and we decided that we we're going to go up on the 15th, hoping to summit around the 20th of the month. And as we got up to camp three, around the 19th or 20th, we got caught in this cyclone and we were getting super heavy winds and a lot of snow and it was very uncomfortable sleeping at, at camp three. I was actually in a tent with my climbing partner, Koki, for over 36 hours. And so imagine being like strapped just in your, in your, in your tent, in your sleeping bag, and just laying there like a, like a mummy for that long. It's really hard to do. And so much part of the mountaineering game is the waiting game because you can't go if the weather's not right. So the weather finally got right. And we made our way from camp three to camp four. Now let me tell you about camp four. Camp four is like being on Mars. Uh, it's very desolate. Uh, it's barren. It's harsh, uh, high winds. Um, there's a lot of leftover tents. It's the only place on the mountain, by the way, where I saw any kind of trash and garbage and everything else was very clean. At Camp 4, there's old remnants of tents that had been there for years. All the tents were ripped up. There were a bunch of old uh, oxygen tanks that were on the ground and various other things. And surprisingly, it's, it's kind of a rocky surface. And unlike Camp 3, which you're sitting at a 45 degree slant, you're kind of on this hump between two mountains, Lhotse and Mount Everest. And, and so I got up there about 6 p.m. on the night of the 22nd, I assembled in the camp and found my, my tent and, and climbed in. And so the whole idea now was to get a little bit to, to eat and then get up at 11.30 or so with the intent of, of, of leaving base camp, 26,500 feet, the death zone as they call it. Um, to go up and 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 go for the summit, and so we were still hoping for the best in terms of weather, and and uh, and so the next thing in all this, which played a major factor, was the food. So the higher you go in the mountain, 
the worse the food gets because now you're starting to get into freeze dried food. And for me, it's really pouring hot water on, on, um, on wood chips or sawdust or something. I mean, it just doesn't taste good. And they disguise this with, you know, flavors of lasagna or, um, chicken or, or granola or, or things like that. And, and to me, it's just, it's, it's just doesn't taste well. My body doesn't, it doesn't react to it very well either from the standpoint of I'd regurgitate a lot of the stuff back up. So really starting about uh, down at camp three, uh, a couple of days before, um, I wasn't eating much and I was just trying to put whatever I could put down my system and it was just little, little bites here and there. And it really had a major effect to me on summit day. So when we were supposed to get up for some reason or another, uh, the guides forgot to wake up our tent. So, so now we, we, we get hurriedly awoken around 1150 and to almost 12 o'clock. And they're like, Hey, we, you know, why didn't you get up? And we got to leave in 20 minutes. So there's this big mid scramble to get out of the tent, put your crampons on, get your stuff and get out. And for me, that's just not a great way to go about anything because when you're mountaineering, you just want to make sure you're thinking. It's hard to think too. When you're on oxygen, you know, you're deprived of, of the O's and your brain's not thinking hundred percent correctly. And so you're really trying to focus on to make sure that, that he's, that, that you've, you've, you've got all the right stuff, the right kind of gloves and the hat and goggles and glasses and everything else that you're going to need to go up and down this. And so nonetheless, you know, we're in this big frantic, get out of your tent, get all this stuff on, put your, your belt on and, and let's go. And so we did that. And as we climbed out of the tent, there were super high winds, 45, 50 mile per hour, and as we got going out of camp, I had a Sherpa. It was the only time that I actually had my own Sherpa. Everybody else had a Sherpa the entire time. And he was a guy that really strong and wanted to go fast. And, and so we were pushing our way up the mountain, going fairly quick. I only had a small scoop of granola and that was it. And as, as we started to go, I, I, was, I was getting just pelted by these small ice sickles maybe ice particles. I'm not sure what you call them, but in my left eye and within an hour I got snow blind. So I literally could not see one thing. And that really came into play further up on top of the mountain. And then the second thing, my face just got whipped with all this, with all these pellets uh, that were coming across. And it was really interesting because it looked like a massive sunburn, big scab, you know, three, four inches across my face the next day when I came down. So so, so off we go, we're going up the mountain. I'm, I'm fighting low energy. I'm fighting this, 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 this issue with being snow blind. Um, my Sherpa wants to go fast and I don't want to do any of those things. I was, was a very strong climber the entire time on that mountain. But on that particular day, I was not, I was not at my best. And so as we kept climbing up and up the mountain, I more or less fell behind. So it was just myself and my Sherpa, which were pretty much in last place. The rest of my teammates had, had were ahead of me and were going much faster and much stronger. They'd been eating, and uh, I just wasn't in that place. So off we went again at 1230 in the morning of the 23rd. And I believe I got to the summit around 1030. And you go up to the balcony, and then from the balcony, you make your way over to the south summit. And from the south summit, you go up to the Hillary Step. And then you make your way to the top. And, you know, some things that really stood out to me, especially when I got up around the Hillary step is, is number one, how flipping steep that is actually it's steep the entire way. But, but when you get there, it's, it's steep in the sense that if you fall, you're going to go all the way down the mountain. You know, you're looking straight at Tibet, which is the North side of the mountain owned by China, China controlled by China. And so it's really critical that you are reaching down and you're clipping into the right fixed line rope. And the problem that I had is I couldn't communicate that to my Sherpa. He didn't understand. I wanted his help, but he couldn't understand that. And number two is that there's not only your rope, but there's also five other ropes that are sitting there um, from past expeditions. And so you got to make sure that you hit the right rope because the other ones are afraid from all the exposure um, that have happened. And then the second thing is that as you go through the spinal probably third of the mountain, you, or you are now starting, starting to go by a number of dead bodies that are laying there. And that's pretty eerie to see, or to, well, to see and to, to stomach. 
my temp mate from 2019 was a guy by the name of Don Cash. Don was a guy that that uh, was a really good dude, a family man, and he was trying to knock off all these summits as quickly as he possibly could. And so after our expedition, January 2019, which he summited, um, he went off a couple of months later to Nepal to summit Mount Everest. And so he's one of those guys that got caught in the long line, took me 18 hours to get just one way to get up there. And he got to the top and he got to the summit, raised his hands and then fell over and died. And so they left him there. And that's what they normally do with the bodies. It's just too dangerous to try to haul anybody that has, that has passed down the mountain over these ice walls, you know, to try to get all the way back down the base camp. It's almost impossible. And so they just leave people there. And so it is a bit of a cemetery, but, you know, I was in such a state of self-preservation of what I could do to keep myself alive that I, I, I looked at it. I thought about it and I kept moving and I just kept telling myself, just focus on, on the fixed line and get yourself and whatever you do, don't stop, keep moving. The other big popular question people have asked me is, Mark, what, what was it like when you got at the top? Was it elation? I've seen videos of people, they're crying, everything else. And quite honestly, I got there and I was so gassed. I just wanted to sit down. And I was almost like, ah, now I got to go all the way back down. Because <laughs> it took me all that time to get up there. And now I got to go back the other direction. We probably sat up there about 45 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes. Uh, there were five other foreign climbers that were up there um, at the time. And then within about 20 minutes, they left. So it was really bizarre to be up there just with my Sherpa at the top of the world, looking down on all these amazing peaks. But again, I was having such a hard time appreciating it because I was so worn out and I was so depleted in every way you could possibly think of. It just, I, I just had a hard time really appreciating the beauty of what I was actually experiencing at that time. And again, I knew that going down was going to be harder than going up because you're more tired and it's as steep as you can possibly be. And again, you have to make sure that you're clipping in the right lines. So off we went back down the mountain and, um, and that's really where the ordeal again kicked in. And, you know, look, going up the mountain and going down the mountain, I kept going about 10 feet and then I just say, Hey, this is the day that Mark doesn't die. And I need to keep going because my daughter, Amelia, and others are supporting me and they would never quit. And I've, I don't want to let these people down. And that's really a lot of the motivation that kept me going. Um, it was a brutal time trying to get down. And again, my Sherpa was trying to really push me to go faster because he had lots of energy and he was doing great. And he just wanted to get back to base camp. Around the, the balcony, 27,500 feet, I ran out of oxygen. And my Sherpa had been about 200 yards down below me because he was trying to keep his own pace. And the problem with that is he was carrying an extra oxygen tank. And so I ran into real problems, not being able to breathe very well, totally exhausted. And late in the afternoon, been out there, you know, 18 hours it took me to go from top to from when we left camp to back, back to base camp. And it was just really challenging. And so finally, this Russian guy came down and he came from behind and I go, hey, would you look at my uh, meter that's on the regulator of the oxygen tank? And sure enough, he said, new ski, new ski, which meant there was no air. And so I said, please tell my Sherpa to stop so I can switch out. And so he went down and he told me finally stop. So I was probably out of O's at 27.5, you know, making my way down for at least 45 minutes. So I finally get down to base camp. That's around five o'clock and I'm just can't believe what I've gone through. And again, I'm so wasted and I'm so depleted that I'm having such a hard time. Like you would think it'd be the, the, the thrill of victory. And I've had a lot of those when I was playing football, last second touchdowns in the end zone, throw my hands out, the crowd goes wild on sports illustrated, all incredible moments, but completely different. I was just so fried. I was just trying to sit down and gather my thoughts like, okay, what do I have to do next? So ultimately I got into my tent about 6 PM. Surprisingly, it was a very nice night and I was wearing all my gear and it felt really warm on my face. And I, I sat out in the sun and just absorbed that for a bit. And then I climbed to my tent and then my oxygen that I'd got coming down, I had on full, full flow. There's four different settings and I had it on max on, on, on four liters per minute. And, and, um, about nine o'clock, those O's ran out 
And uh, <clears throat> this is where things got serious, although I didn't know how serious they were. But my uh, the lead Sherpa, Perba, came by and he asked me, he said, hey, well, I asked everybody in our tent, is everything OK? And I said, well, I ran out of those. And so he said, well, you're going to have to share with the other two girls in your tent because we don't have any more. And at the time, I just said, OK, not really thinking twice about it, like, how is that going to work? And just I frankly, I was so exhausted. I just wanted to, to, to put my head back. But my original goal and what I paid for was to climb Mount Everest and then come down, crawl my tent for four hours or so, then get up and go climb Lhotse. Many of you knew that. And as I was coming down um, the face of, of Everest, you know, from 27 down to our base camp, 26.5, not base camp, camp four, I just said, you know what? I can't do this. I'm not going to do this. If I go up and do load C in a few hours, I will for sure die on this mountain. And, and I've just survived this. And this is the last thing I want to put myself in. And so my whole goal was just to get back to this tent, which I did and just cashed in the goal of, of, of what I had originally set out to do. So essentially I did have three extra oxygen tanks, whether I was going to climb load or not, uh, but they did not give them to me. I don't know the reason why that was. I don't know the reason why he said that we were out of oxygen, but I should have had those. So what ended up happening is from nine o'clock to the next morning, 6 a.m., um, I spent, I was extremely cold. When you don't have oxygen in your system, there's two things that happen. Your energy is greatly reduced and your your body temper, temperature goes goes way down. Even though I was completely clothed with my you know, my climbing gear and these big, thick puffies and everything else, I was freezing. And I, I got into these deep hallucinations and I was hallucinating that I was, I was going to crawl out of my tent. And there was, there was a, a climber that a good guy, Brian, who had been on our ex expedition, but after about day 45, he had, he had a really bad lung infection. He just couldn't shake. And there's no way that he was going to be able to make it up the mountain. And so he ended up flying back. And for some reason, I was hallucinating that, that I was in Chicago and I was trying to climb outside of my tent. I mean, I was literally outside of my bag trying to get out of my tent and go take a hot shower at his house. I thought I was in Chicago at his house. So, but I, my, my brain, there was something in there that kept saying, do not get out of the tent until he knocks three times. I don't know what that is. We all know dreams are wacky and weird. And that was one for me, but it was real. And I mean, it's so, I don't remember any dreams and I, but I remember that one. I mean, it was real and it was, it was just, it was just really telling and it just showed, you know, how close I came to not surviving just that night, you know, alone because I was so deprived of, of no O's. So then I get up the next morning and uh, I was the first one out and I was kind of looking around. I didn't see a whole lot of people, got my crampons on, getting ready to go. And I turned to the lead chirper again and said, Hey, can, you know, I pointed towards like going down. He put his arm out, like go. And so off I went, I thought I was the last person to get out of camp and it turned out I was the first. And so I ended up climbing down halfway down camp three or uh, two towards uh, actually we're, we're going from camp four to camp two. And I ended up going past camp three into camp two by myself before my tent mate, Koki and her Sherpa had shown up. And I was just like, Hey, can I climb with you guys? And of course she said, yes. And she was wonderful and she was amazing um, and got me down. But again, being depleted, not eating anything going on now, like 48, 72 hours, you know, just living on these little hard candies um, being there without any Sherpas, no oxygen, snow blind, I still couldn't see, you know, all these things just wrecked up and it just all came out to like, God, I just got to get up this mountain. And so now we get down to camp two and I talked to my, my tent mate, Koki, and I said, Hey, Coke, if we can get a helicopter out of here, I want to charter it out. And so she's like, you know what? I'm totally in on that. But the, um, the, the cyclone had come back in and so the, the weather had turned and, and helicopters can only fly again when it's clear. So we slept that night. Now this is the 24th, uh, that night. And, and so about four o'clock in the morning, the next morning, um, I get up and we climb down to camp one and now about 6.00 AM, all of a sudden the skies part, it gets clear. And so I say to my, my uh, expedition leader, Gary Madison, I said, Hey, Gary, is there any way we can get the helicopter up here? 
And he said, uh, well, let me give him a call. And so they were actually able to fly one up there. And so Koki and I flew off the mountain. So we, we flew over the top of the, the Kumba Icefall. I did not want to go through that for my sixth time. I, I felt like I'd overcome so much that I didn't want to like tempt the gods anymore. And, and again, that's like rolling dice. And I didn't want to roll any more dice. I just wanted to get off that mountain. And so we flew down to base camp. And then from, from base camp, 17,500, we went in um, and gathered our stuff and a few bags and we packed it up and we had another, another helicopter take us from, from Everest Base Camp 17.5 all the way back down to Kathmandu. And then from Kathmandu, we went and we got COVID tests uh, at the hospital directly right when we got off the, the plane and then, or not the plane, but the helicopter. And then, and then trying to get out of the country was crazy because uh, the entire country of Nepal the next day got shut down. Um, nothing was open, unlike the states where at least you could go to the grocery store, you'd have to stand in line six feet apart, everything shut down. And so through some very creative means, we were able to charter a plane out of the country to get to from, from Kathmandu to Qatar. And then we chartered another plane from Qatar to LAX and got back. And so, I mean, the whole thing was a whirlwind, crazy trip. And even though it cost me extra money to fly out of the country, and, you know, fly off the mountain and all these things. It's just like, what's the price of just mental health and, and healing. And, and so, you know, I finally got back to the hotel, the Yak and Yeti again, and it was really the first time I'd seen myself in, in two months. And there was this picture I took in the mirror and, you know, I dropped 25 pounds. I looked like I was 79 years old and 59 now. And I just looked like I'd aged by years and years and years. I looked awful. And, you know, the thing was, is when I left uh, the Yak and Yeti in early April, the New York Times had done a story on me and taken a picture. And I looked, you know, strong and confident and ready to go. And I just looked completely opposite of that. I mean, I felt that I went from 39 to 79. And, and, and so it was just amazing to me to see what a mountain can do to actually wreak havoc on your body in your mental state. And so you know, the whole goal again was just to get back to California and see my girls. And, and now, you know, there's been a lot of attention and the thing that that's been so wonderful about the tension is not, not so much about tension on me because I had my 15 minutes of fame when I used to play in the NFL and college football at the UW, but it was really about, about almost every single article. It mentions my daughter with epilepsy. It mentions higher ground, which is the organization nonprofit that I work with here in Sun Valley, Idaho, and, and we've continued to raise money and we continue, we'll do that going out in the future. We're turning the NFL movie that's coming out on my whole adventure uh, into a fundraiser here in Sun Valley on the 23rd of September. We're going to be selling tickets and things like that, but hundred percent of all the proceeds go to higher ground and helping all these wonderful athletes out there that need it. And, um, and so I feel very blessed. So this is, this is, this is now the end and, you know, my reflections and my reflections are that as I look around and, and our ability to guess, and it, it was really luck, not skill, to put ourselves in a position to be up there on the 22nd so that we could go the one and only day that people were summoning, which was the 23rd. And then as of the 24th, the cyclone hit again and brought four feet of snow. And so between our expedition groups and groups I've gone with multiple times in other mountains that really wanted me to go with their group, which at the end of the day, I picked Madison Mountaineering, great choice, to picking the right day, to not getting COVID, to not getting blocked by the, the cyclone. I mean, we had so many things that could have gone wrong that at the end of the day, they just didn't. And so some was skill, a lot was luck. And the other was being in the right place at the right time. And that's just one of the things that happened. I've been saying this now for a long time, that if you keep working, 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 you know, some people call you lucky, but usually when you're lucky, you're always winning. And at least I don't know any people that have a lot of luck and they lose. So those two don't go together. But I put myself in the right position. And I had to, all those times I was going up and down the mountain here in Sun Valley, Idaho with my best buddy, Jim Mora up and down and up and down and up and down. And, and, you know, all these two a day workouts, all that kind of stuff. 
ultimately, and at the end of the day, I had to dig into all those chits in the bank and I had to use every single one of them. But, you know, as I go forward, people keep asking me, Mark, what's next? And I've got a bunch of stuff on my plate right now that I want to do. And one of the things, of course, is this film and there's some charity events, other charity events I'm working with here with, with higher ground that we're putting together. But, you know, as I go forward, I just don't want to suffer anymore. And anybody listening to this, and I'm sure understand, you know, what that's about, but two months is a long time to be away. Um, you know, extreme danger. My goal nine years ago when I was going through a rough patch was to set such a big goal that, Nobody had really done that. And I'm talking about now NFL players climbing mount, mountains. There's not that many, the kind of mountain I was climbing. And, and, and so I really had to kind of go back to the goal. And, you know, I've, I've now climbed all seven summits, uh, which are the highest peaks on every continent around the world, capping off of Mount Everest. I've been looking forward for this for a number of years and finally was able to realize my dream. And, and, you know, through this whole thing, there's been all these blessings. The podcast has been a blessing um, being, involved in various charities um, and seeing the benefits of all that, all these amazing people I've met, the healing I got through nature, moving to some Valley, you know, all these things have happened because really I was going through a, a, a rough time. And I think it just speaks for me to, and to anybody else that sometimes, you know, just when things look bleak and you don't know what the next step is going to be, sometimes you just have to step into the fear and go for it and go for something big and it, you know, it just blows my mind that all the gifts have come back my way. And I'm so appreciative to all the people who have listened to this podcast, listened to this one right now. And again, followed me on this journey. So as we go forward, I'm going to continue to do these podcasts. I'm really excited about them. And uh, we've got some really cool people coming around the corner and um, just going to another level with these pods and, you know, my foundation work and other things. So I'm recording this today on July 2nd. Happy 4th of July. I'm going to try to get this out here fairly quickly, get back into the game, and then I will be coming on and announcing updates to the film when you guys can see it, how you can see it. Pictures tell a thousand words, and you're going to see some unbelievable shots that the NFL people, um, not only when they're here in Sun Valley filming a lot, but also a lot of the footage that we took up in the mountain, you know, avalanches coming down on us every day the ice fall going to the top. I mean, it's all there. It's pretty insane. And, um, it'll be scary for me to watch myself on a big screen, but it is what it is. And again, if it can help others, uh, not only get through whatever they're going through, but also, um, raise more money for, um, these wonderful classes, then I'm all in on that. So on that note, thank you so much for listening. And, uh, if you have any questions, comments, anything, you can always reach out on my website, www.markpattisonnfl.com and I look forward to hearing from you and continuing on. All right. That's it. I'm out. Thanks. Bye. Hey, and thank you so much for listening to the Find Your Summit podcast. We are so glad to have you along for this journey. And if you enjoy the show, please tell a friend, share it on iTunes, spread it to the planet. We're looking to broadcast this to every person that is out there because, as you know, everybody has their own summit that they're going after. Okay, if you're looking to follow my journey, you can find that through my social links on markpattisonnfl.com. That's Mark, M-A-R-K, Pattison, P-A-T-T-I-S-O-N, nfl.com. So until the next podcast, just remember, clear eyes, full hearts, and remember, it takes a little more to make a champion, so make it happen. Thank you. Bye. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.